I think it's about time. We got about 23 people in here. Um, so we're going over 12C homework from the book. So hopefully you viewed the, the, the video already and, and went through the handout. Um, so if you went through the handout, you should have noticed there's basically like four different tests that we're doing in this section. Um, one's called Hamilton's uh, apportionment, one's Jefferson's apportionment, one's Webster's apportionment, and one is the Hill Huntington apportionment. And so hopefully your homework should look something like this. And so we're doing what, 15 through 18, 21, 25, 29, 34, and 35. I believe there's like eight problems in all. And so if we start here, the 15 through 18, it says what? The following table shows the 2010 population of four states and their numbers of seats in the House of Representatives. Find the standard quota for each state and compare it to the actual number of seats for the state. Then explain if it's over or underrepresented. Uh, assume a total U.S. population of 309 million in 2010, and there are 435 House seats. Okay. So if we want to know what portion, like the population of Connecticut is, How would you figure something like that out, I guess, is the first question. Is there a way I could cover this, maybe? And so we know the population is, where is it? The population of Connecticut is about 3 million. And so if we want to know like what portion that is out of the whole population, we're going to do what with it? So you're going to divide by the number of house seats available? Uh, so this is the population of Connecticut. We want to divide by not the house seats, but we want to divide by, I was thinking total pop to get the, the, uh, the ratio of the people in Connecticut to the people in the U.S., right? And so this is going to give us the, the fraction of people that live in, in Connecticut. Our worksheets tell us to do like something different, I thought. Does it tell you a little different approach? I might have it in a different order. I, to be honest, I didn't pay that much attention when I did these first four. Um, yeah, I divided it by the 710 number. I don't know if anybody else did it that way too. The 710? I'm not sure where that 710 is coming from. I, I did it yeah. by 435. What do you divide by? 435, the number of house seats. Yeah, but uh, yeah. the first page. You would divide by the number of house seats per population. Total population, population divided by the number of house seats, and it came to like a seven something number. I'm not working, so I don't know. I reprinted a blank sheet. And then yeah. I divided that number. The other number, and I got 503. Because before you find before you find the standard quota, you have to find the standard divisor, and that's what the 735 and you divide this by what 435 I'm not sure where's the 710 coming from that you're getting That's on um, the first handout. You need to find the standard divisor. You're dividing the total population between the number of seats. And that gives you uh, 710,345. That's the standard divisor. 
Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. Total population over. And then to check out the standard quota, you divide state oh, population okay. I with know the how standard divisor. I know how they're looking at it. Okay. So you take 309 and you divide this by 435. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So the, yeah, the, 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 the number of seats. Okay. And then that gives you what they call the standard divisor. And that gives you the standard divisor. Okay, I think the... Uh, this uh, that's okay that'll give you the divisor they're making a ratio and, and I think I'm just making the ratio in a, in a different sort of way than what they're doing it in the book and it should give you the same number so we should be dividing this by our answer it gives you like five and some change right yeah okay. and so I think if I write this I think this is just in a little bit of a different order. So if we want to know what proportion like Connecticut is to the US, this is the way I did it. That's going to be the proportion of people that live in the Connecticut compared to the US. And then I took that and I multiplied it by 435, which I think you should get the same number. We're just, I think we're just constructing ratios a little bit differently. Because basically what we're doing is we're trying to create sort of like equivalent fractions, right? We know like so much uh, Connecticut to the U.S. I guess is what I'm doing. And so I'm creating something like Connecticut to the U.S. And so I know the population is 3574, and create that three oh nine zero 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 zero. And if you want to do some, you know, probably want to do heavy algebra. <laughs> uh, but four thirty five is the total U.S. What I'm doing is I'm creating these sort of equivalent sort of fractions, and so I know I'm going to end up multiplying these two numbers and then dividing by this one, which I think is what you did pretty much, just in a reverse order. So if you do it your way, you come out with 5.03. Yep, should come up with the same number. So I think we're, you're, we're doing things in the same, we're doing the same process, just in different direction, probably. Different order. Um, Mr. Martinez, do you have a preference for which order they go in, which way? I don't know. Um, I, I don't really have a preference. The activity, um, the activity put some emphasis on finding what was called the standard divisor, which is taking the population and dividing it by the number of seats. So in a way, we sort of get a value of um, every seat is worth a certain amount of the population, a certain value. What Mr. Seavers is doing, the math is, I, in a way, it's like identical. You can get the same answer, but I think he's doing it in a more logical manner, a, taking a population out of the total, and that gives you like a percentage of, what were they, Connecticut. So his big fraction at the front gives him a percentage uh, uh, that Connecticut is worth, and then if you multiply that percentage by the number of seats, you get back the right number of seats. So it's a different way of doing it. It's just uh, the activity and the textbook does put a little bit of stress on this thing called the standard divisor. So. So doing it the way she was doing, is that gonna, that can go across the board no matter which type of apportionment table you're using, right? Um, uh, yeah, it should work. Um, the only thing that I would have to check is 
uh, and Severs might know better on this though, but uh, the test that we're gonna be giving you, if it doesn't specifically ask the question for the standard advisor, then you can use the method that he's doing. There may be a question that will ask you for the standard advisor, but you'd have to, I don't remember that as a question on the test, but if it is, then you know you could mention it. Hey guys, I'm sorry to butt in, but if you aren't speaking or don't have a question, will y'all please turn your microphones off because it keeps cutting in and out of the video where we're trying to look. Yeah, and, and I can kind of see like if, if you really want to see the relation, you could put this over one and like I don't know if it really helps. But this denominator you can kind of move over to, to over this guy and you can kind of swap their denominators. You're just multiplying by one on the bottom; it's not going to change. So if we divide what 435 by the 309 million, and then we multiply it by the three million, we should get the same number. And I think that's the process y'all are doing, right? Or did I do that backwards, maybe? Yeah, what it tells you to do is multiply total population by number of seats and then take that number. Um, okay. The standard divisor and then the state population is divided by the standard divisor. So it, se it seems like it's just kind of adding a step that's not necessary. Or I don't know, it just makes it seem more complicated. The way you did it makes more sense to me. Yeah, uh, just though so you might not, everybody might have followed this part. It's um, in the activity, the way it covers it, there's two divisions because you create a standard divisor, then you divide by that divisor. Because you divide twice, it's sort of like you multiply by the reciprocal. So that's how it comes back to what Sievers is showing in that method so you never see in his example the 435 as a denominator but that's just because of uh the old rule keep change flip sort of thing okay and then I guess the other question they ask is it over or underrepresented? I believe what was, what was the number that they gave us? Five in there? You can start to cover stuff up. Five did they give us for that one? Well, there's my papers here. Let's see it now. There we go. Underneath. Underneath everything. Okay. Uh, yeah. So they said it was five, and so if, if we get five point oh three, how does five point oh three represent or relate to five? Or how does five re rep relate to five point oh three? I should say that's the better way to say it. So they're getting five representation, and they should get five point oh three representations, and so they're a little fraction like under, right? So they're a little underrepresented. Does that make sense compared to five? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And if this is what my Connecticut problem looks like, you could probably guess what my Georgia problem is going to look like. <laughs> I'm getting something like 13.63. But if we take it. 45, somewhere around there? I can't, you can't see what you're writing down there. Um, yeah, it's just too far, okay.
And once we get the 710, we're dividing what, that 9 million by that 710 number? It should give you that same number, 13.6. I guess I can go in right here. He's a warm leave on there. Put there, there. I'm sorry. So I got I got too hung up on the original way we were doing it. So we're gonna divide the the population of Georgia by the total population to get 435. Or no, I'm sorry, and multiply by 435. I'm not getting the same answer. Are you talking about up here? Yes. Uh, so if you divide that 9 million by that 309 million, it should give you like a really small fraction. So do okay. the division first. Okay. And then you multiply by 435? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. And so that should give you like 0 0.03135 or something when you divide those two things somewhere around there. And if we're at 13.63, and they were represented with 14. And so if they have 14 representation, and they only deserve, like, what, 13.36? So compared to 14. Okay, we're together on this, hopefully. Okay, that's Connecticut, Georgia. Uh, there's not a lot of difference between these two problems and the next two problems. Next thing I'm looking at is Florida. And so I have it this way. I guess I could go ahead and work out the other way. Do what, 309? And so I believe this number should still be the same number that it's been throughout the whole thing. It should be the, I just have it written, 710345, right? 710345. And now I'm taking the 18 million and dividing by that 710345. Question. Uh, yes. So are you saying that we are safe to take it to the third behind the decimal and we can go ahead and, and uh, round up on that one on all or no? Um, I mean, because your answer is 26.46785717, but you've only taken it to the third, so 26.468 because you rounded up. Obviously. Yeah, I will, I will go to like three decimals on this guy probably. Is that every one of these or no? You'd be pretty safe finding the quota when you're finding the quota to round it to three decimal places. There's a few, like when we do the comparison, you might want to take it to more decimal places to see when one one like becomes more than the other. You might have to take it to more decimal places, but that's not till we start doing like the test, I think. Oh, I need to admit these people. There we go.
And it says what, 26, and we're comparing that to the 27. That 27 represents what? Overrepresentation, right? That's more than what they're what they should have. Hey, can you let Dana back in the room? She lost service and is trying to get back in. Uh, I think I did just now, hopefully. Her iPhone, there it is. Questions about this? I can't let me go through this too quick. No, I think it's easy. The first four, I think, are, are pretty much a little straightforward compared to the other four. Uh, the other four, you might have to like do a little bit, bit of memorizing on what the heck those names mean. <clears throat> uh, if I'm being honest, this is like the first time I've ever seen these tests. <laughs> uh, Hey, so are we going to have to memorize each way that it's done? Like each one, like when it talks about um, the Webster versus what's his name, Hamilton, uh, are we going to have to memorize those or will there, will there be a reminder somewhere on the test? We'll just have to do the math. I think, I think the question might be a little bit leading because we're going to give you like a table and like, Kind of set up the table so you know what you need for the test if that helps sure <laughs> uh, and i think that i think that'll pretty much lead you to kind of like where you need to go for the most part the okay. bullet has to be kind of the same format as the homework like the c12 um, for you and then kind of goes through each one yeah, I want to say, yeah, it's kind of similar to like the, the, the worksheet that he worked through. It's kind of similar to that. It'll have like the, the table kind of set up for you. And hopefully having the table set up will kind of lead you in the right direction. You know, whether we're asking uh, different quotas or whether we're asking uh, for the fractional remainder, you know, for the Hamilton. I guess the one thing that you might have to memorize is, is, is um, oh, what's that last guy? The Huntington method, you might have to memorize that rule of which one has to be less than or more than the other one. That might be something. Um. Okay, now we're going to Ohio. Um. You don't get to travel around much. So this is still the same number. 309 million divided by 435, that's at 310, what, 345? And so I want to take the 11 million, divide it by that 310345, and I should get that same number, right? 15.983. And if I look at 15.983 and I want to compare it to the 16, or 16, sorry, I don't know how to say numbers anymore. Well, if I want to compare that 15.98 to 16, this is the representation. This is how much they should get. These guys are overrepresented. considered over representation when they're that close to the number the, it's yeah and i think the book like i think the book specifies it's like slightly overrepresented versus overrepresented or something 
I didn't really specify. That'd be a slight overrepresentation, but it still is more than they should get, right? Yeah, okay. Even though it's a little bit, it's still more. Any questions on anything so far? I think I'm able to go back to 17 whenever you get a chance. Back to 17? Yeah, I just need to take a look at it real quick. That one? It was overrepresented. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, cool. I just want to make sure. So those were those four. I think we found out everything we need there. Uh, okay. So I think those four, I'm not trying to speak too soon, but I think those four were a little more straightforward than the other four. The other four are getting more into the test, right? Uh, when should they? Oh, that's a good question. You can help me with. Okay. Someone asked. Whoa! Don't do that. Uh, someone asked, like, when when do they be fairly represent represented? They'd be fairly represented if I got like an even sixteen here, right? If I got like an even sixteen and their number was sixteen, only if there's like no decimal would it be like even represented. You would just take the number itself, right? Okay. Any questions about those first four? I think we're about to get into like the testing, right? Okay. What's on this first? Twenty one? So 21, they give us this table. They want us to fill it out with Hamilton's. And so let's see if I can do this without giving you all the solutions. So I made some tables for these problems. So we want to do these with Hamilton's. So if we look at these populations, one of the first things I think, I don't know, I think they gave you that on this one, right? They gave you the 5,000. So if they don't give you the 5,000, the first thing you want to do is like add all these up. Make sure you have your total there. And we see that. And now we're trying to find that, that divisor. What, what's, what's the stupid name they give it in the section? I don't remember. What's the divisor's name in this thing? We divide 5,000 by 100 and find that number. Called the standard, the standard divisor. divisor. The standard divisor. Okay. It's the standard one. That's what I need to remember. Uh, okay. So the standard divisor, if we do 5,000 divided by 100, should give us what? 50, I believe. Okay. So if we divide each of these by 50, I think we should get these numbers. Does that seem about right? Yes, that's what I got. Okay. And this is what they call like the, the standard quota. They're talking about the thing with the decimal behind it. <clears throat> okay. And so that's the standard quota. If we want the minimum quota, it's just that thing, and we take the decimal away, basically, right? And so this is Hamilton's method. This is the first one that like we, we kind of threw at you, and I think this, I don't want to speak too soon, but I think this is probably the easiest of the four. It's kind of the most straightforward, what you think. At this point, you might also want to add your minimum quota. And you might want to realize we're missing, what, two of them here? So we're going to have to make up two of these guys somehow. 
So C and B. Exactly. We look at the fractional remainder. The largest two fractional remainders are the ones that get it, right? And so the plus ones are going to those two. And so we have 18. We have 23 becomes 24. The 43 becomes 44. And we keep it at 14. We add those four numbers together. We get, what, 100? And this is the thing we call Hamilton's method. It's a big fancy way to say, look at the decimal and move up the one that's closest, right? Questions about any of this, and about this approach? And so first one is Hamilton, the next one. So that's 21, 25, let's see. Let me do this one. Grab it. What does 25 say? Uh, so the, they're looking at 25, they're looking at the Alabama paradox. And so first we wanna do it with 100 representatives. We wanna portion this with 100 representatives is the first step uh, and use, shoot, did I use Hamilton's in this? And then we wanna portion it into 101. And so the first one is to do 100. And they gave us A, B, and C, 950, 670, and 246. So those are the numbers that are coming straight from the problem. This thing is the total. So to find the total, you add these three things up. That's your total. And if we have 1866 and we want 100, the standard divisor is going to be what 1866 divided by 100. I think I wrote it like oh no, I can't see it. Let me zoom out a little bit. <laughs> I wrote my divisors over here when I did them. 18.66 should be the number that we're dividing by, right? And if we do that, we get like 15.911, 35.905, 13.18. I probably did a horrible job at rounding those evenly, but they're there. Okay. And if I want, that's my standard quota. And almost always after my standard quota, I'm gonna find my minimum quota. So if I want the minimum quota, it's the number without the fraction. It's the whole number. So 50, 35, 13 are the three numbers that I'm getting for my minimum quota. If I add those three numbers, you might notice I'm getting 98. So there's two of these things I need to throw, throw something into. I've got to add two somehow. And so I didn't even do a line for the fractional remainder. But if I just look at the fractional remainder, I didn't even do a line for it. Uh, the 0.9 and the 0.9 are obviously the larger ones. And so those two are going to get a plus one. And so if we want Hamilton's, it should look something like this, 51, 36, 13. That's half the problem.
the other half, they want to do it with 101 now. And so now we're doing 1866. Divide by 101 should give you like 18.475, I believe. So now we want to try to apportion it with 101 seats. And just so, so, so we're not like. Right. Oh. Sorry. 1866 divided by 101 is where I'm getting that number from, my standard divisor. I divide each of my populations by that standard divisor. So I'm looking back up here at my populations. I divide 950 by 18.475, I get 51.42. So on with the 670 and 246. I'm getting these three numbers. So now I found my standard quota. The next thing that I'm almost always gonna find after my standard quota is my minimum quota. And if I look at my minimum quota, I have 51, 36, and 13. If I add these three together, I'm getting one, 100. I want a whole 101 Dalmatians or something. Okay, so how do I get from 100 to 101? You probably know this one already. I have to add one. I have to add one on the largest fraction, which is this guy, the 4 to 2. So the 0.42 is the largest fraction. This one gets added one. Now this guy is 52. That guy is going to be 36 and 13. And now if we add them, we're going to get the 101. Okay. And so we found these two things. And the last question that they ask is, does this, is this like representative of that Alabama paradox that they talked about? No, it's not, right? No, and do you have an explanation? Uh, because the paradox happens when more than one seat gets appointed to a state extra. Yeah, I would say like this one gets one, this one gets one. Right. So like it's never going to take away this one that this one got and this one got. They're going up or they're staying the same, right? Yeah. So Alabama happens is when you like add, add one here and you don't add it here, right? I believe. Or wait, vice versa. When you add one here, but you don't add it here. It's not when one state gets added two extra or, yeah, two. I think adding two extra can cause it to happen, but I believe it's when you're like, you originally would add like, uh, what's a good um, I can answer that question. Uh, what Brittany is referring to happens a little bit later. It's called the quota criterion. That's okay. the case. That's, That's the case where, yeah, it either goes up or it goes down but it can't go so far up that it's going to like round to the next number plus an additional one. Yeah. So you're thinking in that case, the Alabama paradox happens when you add some number of extra seats, but then when you re -go, when you go through Hamilton's method again, somebody actually loses a seat. See, the paradox is if we're going to add more seats overall, somebody should be gaining more seats. Nobody should be losing them. That's yeah, the I Alabama think, paradox. Yeah, is somebody like loses. One, right, and that would be Alabama's paradox because it was thirty-six here and it went down here. Right? Does that create Alabama's paradox? Um. Uh. Because we gained a seat and now we lost it, right? Or is it different? Well, all right. So what you have in black? Those are the final apportionments. Yeah, and so if okay. it was 
if it was 36 it, originally and it went down, we would have lost a, a seat there. Right, if it had gone down, but it yeah. didn't. Uh, um, so you, the extra seat just went to. Uh, is it a? Went here. It went to A, and that that's what we would expect to happen. So no paradox. Uh, yeah, so I guess the answer is kind of, uh, I don't know, <laughs> nothing happens. <laughs> it is not a case of the paradox. Yeah, I, I think the main thing is that your seat numbers are going to go down from here to here, though, right? Yeah, that'd be exactly right. It, it would end up like the case, maybe what you could imagine, don't worry about all the um, the decimal numbers, but um, uh, maybe the 51 went up to 52, the 13 goes up to 14 but the 36 goes down to 35. If the, num yeah, if the numbers, if, if anybody loses a seat from their apportionment, that's the paradox. Because the idea was is that we added one more seat. So if you added one more seat, shouldn't somebody just gain one? Nobody should lose one, but it can happen. It can happen. It didn't happen in this case. Where am I at? 29 now? So that was 25. 21 and 25 were both about Hamiltons. So I think, if anything, hopefully you can do a Hamiltons. Okay. So 29. 29 gives us these numbers. Where are we at? 98, 689, 212. And they tell us a modified divisor of 9.83. So if we want to look at this. This is my first row I have. I have 98, 6, 89, 212. And if I add those all up, I get 999. I want to portion those. You can already see those numbers to that paper, huh? I want to portion those into 100. And so if I look at these, 999 divided by 100 is going to be what? 9.99, I believe. So I should be dividing everything by like 9.99. If I divide 98 by 9.99, I get 9.81, divide each one by 9.99. This. I have an X min. I believe min quota comes next. So the min quota of each of these is 968 and 21. And if we add up the min quota, you might notice you're, what, two seats short? So add up the min and quota. Hopefully you realize you're two seats short. And if we do that, we look at the next, our modified quota. So the 9.83 is the number that they give us to divide by. So if we divide by 9.83, 98 divided by 9.83 will give you something like 
And you might have noticed what we gained two. I believe we gained two in this one, right? We went from 68 to 70. So now we're looking at these. We've used our, we're not Hampton, we're on Jefferson method now. This is the Jefferson method. And so now we're looking, the 9.96 is still going to give us just nine. That 70.09 is going to give us 70, and that's going to be what, 21? If we add those all up, I believe that should give us the 100 seats. So you might notice what this one didn't go up at all. This one, this 21 didn't go up at all. This 68 increased by what? Two points. And so then the other question they ask us on here, uh, they ask us to do it by Jefferson's method. And then they ask us, is the, oh, what's the word? The quota, the quota criterion, that's the word. Is the qu quota cri criterion met? And I think this is the thing like Brittany was hitting on earlier. No, it's not met. No, it's not met because we go up by like more than one, right? And so basically if you go up by more than one, your quota criterion is gonna not happen. Are there questions about these numbers? Where they're coming from? Anything about them? Anything? Okay. 29, we got two more, 34 and 35. <laughs> Get that? <laughs> okay. Okay, so what does 34 and 35 say? The last two methods that we're doing. <laughs> Webster's method. Uh, okay. Do you know, is there a way to open the, um, open the tables on a separate page without leaving the textbook page? Uh, you could probably download the PDF or the, the image from the table, but that like, that seems like a lot of work. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, So 34, they want us to use Webster's method on exercise 20. Exercise 20 is over here. It gives us these numbers. We have five colleges. They're 560, 1250, 1760, 2340. Okay. I didn't write, even write A, B, C, D, E. I guess I could have done that. I got a little lazy, maybe. I guess I'm going to go A, B, C, D, E. But they give us five different things. We can count all the way to letter E. And then if we add those five things up, we should get that total there. So hopefully, if you're on the test, you can at least give like this line, right? 
Okay, so the next thing we want to do is find the standard quota. So we want to divide this up into, I believe the question says 18 seats. So we do 7380, we divide that by 18. That gives me a really big number, like 410. So I'm dividing everything by 410. Divide by 410 is the, is the name of the set. And so, I don't know if I said this already, but do math in pencil so your work doesn't look like this. Um, so we're dividing each of these by 410. We should get these numbers 1.373, 3.63, 4.29, 5.71. And these should all add up to that 18 that we're talking about. And then you probably got this. After standard quota, we're going to find min quota. I know it's a big difference. We've been doing the same process, right? Standard quota, min quota. I'm hoping you can get these first two steps down. 1.37 is 1, 3 is 3. So this, this would have what exact representation here. So I think someone asked that question earlier. So we see an example that has exact representation. In reality, I can almost <laughs> guarantee you this will almost never happen in reality, right? Almost never, right? But if we add these, what, five numbers up? One plus three plus three plus four plus five, I believe should give us 16. And so we might notice that we're two away from what we need. Steve, we had two, we had the biggest is seven, seven one and six one, one one. C and E to add on one. Okay. And then the next thing is a, is a modified quota. And so uh, I, modified quota. Is, yeah, I'm uh, not sure they really they don't really tell you like how they're finding these things too much. What will pretty much is give them to you. I think I did a modified quota of 400 work, I believe. If I divided everything by 400, I got something like this. So this may may have been mentioned, but I'm still a little confused. What when it talks about the modified divisor, I I, I don't really understand what that means. Does it matter? Does the number matter as long as it's lower? Um, it does matter. It has to work for what you want it to work for, I think. Because if I if I make it low enough, these other ones like this one will come up to over five, and this one will come up to over five if I make it a small enough number. Um, but I believe the rule on Jefferson's at this point is if it's over 0.5, we round it up. If it's below 0.5, it rounds down. And so I think, to be honest, I think you can just look at this line and do it. Um, and it would give you the same solution. But that 1.4 is going to round down. That 3 is going to round down. That 3.725 will round up. That 4.4 is going to round down. That 5.8 is going to round up. I guess my question is, what made you choose 400? Um, what if the what if the guy had chosen uh, 405? 
that would probably still work as well on this one. Any number between 400 and 410 is, is going to work on this one. Because even that 410 would work f for this. It's it's kind of silly that they gave you something that works without the modified quotient, to be honest. I would have tried to, like, probably did the numbers a little better, but... We won't ever have to find the modified divisor, right? No, no, we're not going to make you find that modified uh, quotient. Okay. Yeah, it should be provided. And so the, the rule is 0.5, right? 0.5, more than 0.5, we round up. Less than 0.5, we round down. So typical rounding rules, I don't know how else you want to say it, but typical rounding is what we're doing, right? And then if we add those numbers up, 1, 3, 4, 4, and 6 should give you 18. So we were too short, and we kind of verified and add one here, one here. Rest we rounded down, <clears throat> so that's where those two are coming from, right? Okay, so the last one. So that was Webster's method. They're going to give you a modified uh, quota to divide things by. And then you use the, the basic rounding rules to either round up, round down. The last thing that we're going to talk about is Heel Huntington method. 35 says you use it on exercise 19. So we're pulling these numbers off of 19. So a large company has four divisions. They give us these four numbers. And there are a total of 35 computer technicians that must be allocated. So there's 35 seats that we need to divide these up into. So you could probably just like, based off of everything that we've done so far, you could probably just like write those first two, three rows, say population, standard Q, min Q. <clears throat> If we look at the population of these four things, we add them together, we should get 1350. We want to divide this up into 35 seats. And so if we're looking here, 1350 divided by 35 should give me the number 38.57, somewhere around there. I think is the number I have here, 38.57. That's our standard quota. The next one, we drop the decimal, we call that our minimum quota. And this is another one of those ones you have to like play around with to get a special number. We're like two, we're two away from the thing that we need, right? 
and trying to figure out like what number it is you have to figure out how to make two of these things go up <laughs> um it's a little weird but it's doable but i'll i'll just give you the modified and i kind of picked this out of the book to be honest 38.4 is what their modified quota is going to be so we do 38.4 as our modified quota you can see i messed up a few times here and this is another reason you should do math and pencil Okay, so that's our modified quota. The other thing that we talked about in the notes was this thing called a geometric mean. And so if I want to find the geometric mean of like six, I'm going to take six, I'm going to multiply it by the next number seven, and then I'm going to do a square root. So if I do that, it should give me something like 6.48. If I do that with eight and nine, it should give me something like 8.48. If I do it with nine and 10, it should give me this number. And if I do a 10 and 11, it should give me something like that number. I have a question. Yes. What is the purpose of the geometric mean? Like, I didn't understand how, why we're using that to figure the, hunt, the hill, Huntington. Um, the best, <laughs> and it's not really answering your question, but the best reason I can say we're doing it is because it's used in this test. Um, there's there's like whole other like areas where that that sort of thing is is used. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, what they're doing is they're they're taking a square like. It, it, this has to do a little bit with like math history. The Greeks were really obsessed with sort of geometry and stuff, and so they're looking at a square. And what is a square that's between a six square and a seven square, or six by six and a seven by seven, right? Like, what is the dimension that would be, like, an average between those two things? And so I think what it's doing is I believe it's taking the mean of the area sort of thing and finding out what dimension will give you that in between. It's kind of a weird thing. It's used sometimes. <clears throat> Just to divide it more evenly, I guess, between the two. Um... I'm trying to think of a good answer to give you because I mean I know I've seen it used in other calculations. I, um, I I'll, I'll chime in on what my opinion is with it. So, um, I so yes, it is used for other things. What I because if you look at all the the names of the people, like kind of think history wise, what I'm thinking is a lot of these decisions on how to do the apportionment were more p politically set like somebody who wanted a certain person to win kind of came up with an idea on how to do well let's you know find a different divisor and then we'll do this and then we'll do that and at some point somebody came up with geometric mean and said hey well let's do this because it might help out but you know that's just my thought it might be all uh propaganda so are you saying it was like an early form of gerrymandering it's, yeah, I guess sort of uh, just a, a, man, a way to manipulate numbers to get like a better outcome. I mean, I don't know like actual specific case where that started in there, but that was sort of the kind of the opinion that came to is like, why are there so many different methods? And like, why can't you just round it? Why would you even bother with like Hamilton's method sounds fine. I think it sounds fine. Why would you have the others? So I think it was all that's again, this is just my speculation. But it was all just, yeah, like you said. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was I political. Imagine, I would imagine they all have kind of like their benefits and their drawbacks because, like, you're talking about Hamilton's, but then you have like the Alabama paradox, and you'll have weird things that happen like that that maybe like make it not so good of like being an accurate representation of what's happening, right? And then you have like Jefferson's and then I remember there's, there's a few paradoxes they listed in the book that could, could pop up with Jefferson's. Um, and so the, these, they, they all have their kind of advantages and drawbacks, I guess is, is what it is. And 
I, I would imagine like, you know, political opinion probably plays into that as well. Like which one do you think is best is probably going to be the one that favors <laughs> your party the most. Um, so I'm almost certain like geometric means came back in like the, probably the BC era back when like uh, Greek geometers uh, kind of were advancing math. Uh, okay, so the rule is if your modified quota is greater than your geometric mean, we're going to add one. And so if the modified quota is greater than the geometric mean, we add one. It is not here, don't add one. It is greater here, we add one. It is not there, we do not add one. So seven, eight, 10, and 10. If we add those, I believe it should give you your 35 seats. Any questions on this last one? Uh, Mr. Martinez, are you still there? Yes. Hey, uh, do, do you have that review up yet? Uh, I posted it during class. Okay. Yeah, because I noticed the video was up, so the review should be up. Uh, yeah, so Sabrina was asking about like 5A, so I went ahead and like during the lesson I uploaded the 5A stuff. We, it's just going to be Wednesday's class, and then the the review is also up there. You All did right, a, so you did a video. Mike, for yes, the far, sorry, sorry, go speak. You did a video for the review. I did, man. I hooked you up, except for the last part, the apportionment, because it is incredibly hard to come up with problems for apportionment with all the modified divisors. So unfortunately, when you get to the end of the, uh, the video or even the end of the, uh, the document, when you print it out for that one, part nine just says, by the way, review over this stuff. So, uh, but it, it does look a lot, you guys were asking earlier, it does look a lot like your open-ended questions on the 12C homework. If you can do that table, if you can do the table that's that's on your homework tonight, then you're going to be good for that last question on the test. Yeah. So, no, I think I think. Go ahead. I think I may have misunderstood. So our exam is this coming Wednesday. Do we oh. also have class that day? All right, that, that's incorrect. All right, so in the order that you guys need to do things for a priority for us, uh, Wednesday's class is going to be 5A. 
We're going to start talking about, so just like today was 12C, Wednesday's class is going to be 5A, which is the first section for the next unit. After that, you can start working on, unless you already began working on the review, you can then work on the review as long as you have the tests done by Friday at midnight, then you'll be oh, good. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so, okay, so I guess I misunderstood. I thought the test was due at the end of Wednesday. Okay. Uh, no, and it is confusing. I get it because we flip-flopped. We, right. we sort of flip-flop stuff on there to make up for that lost day. So, um, so what I'm going to ask everybody here um, is Wednesday, make sure that you're prepared for 5A. I get it that there's a test that's coming up and it's going to be on Friday, but don't sacrifice your lesson for 5A, the class time in 5A, because you're going to need to know that for the future anyway. So let 5A happen. If you want to take all of Thursday to review, you can do that. That's fine. Um, there's a video for it. So it pretty much walks you through how to do everything. And um, I think even in the video at some point, maybe towards the beginning, I was like, unless it was just in my head, so I'll say it right now, but at some point I was at least thinking, man, this is crazy. Like I'm like taking you through the review exactly how to do it. And then you're going to be taking the test at home. So you're literally going to have the review sitting next to you. You're not supposed to, but we can't stop you from having it. So I, I get you guys might be like worried about the test that's going to be on a Friday and you want to do your best, but I mean, kind of think about it. There's a video where I'm going to go through the review for you. You don't have to have the test done until Friday midnight. And even though you really shouldn't, you can technically have the review out while you're taking the test. Okay. So you shouldn't really panic too much. Just wait, wait until you're done with five A to, to, to start looking at that stuff. Now, so five A is not a part of this exam, correct? No. Correct. Yeah. That is a correct statement. Five A is going to be part of unit four. Um, I'm going to be instructing class Wednesday, which is 5A. So again, I'm going to say, please do the notes, watch the video that I put up for that one, and and be prepared for the class, right? Otherwise, I think there, there's a few different things we cover in that one, and I don't want the class to just like be a flop because everybody's working on the review. Okay. Do you remember what unit the, this test is going to start at? Um, it's everything in seven that we covered. So seven A, B, C, D. And okay. It's the last two things we did with 12. Okay. Um, so it involves a good amount of probability. I don't think any of them are like too difficult as far as problems. Um, nothing. Yeah. I didn't think anything was too hard. Um, uh, it was probability. It was definitely the voting, the apportionment. There was something, oh, like expected value, the insurance policy stuff, those questions. Um, and remember, you just have like one of each thing. Um, anyway, uh, the documents on Blackboard, so I mean, you guys can open that up right now if you want. You can take a look at it. So when we log into your site, remember that you gave us? Uh, Wednesday, yeah. I think Ana Issa had a question. I don't know if we get answered it already. Who is that? Yeah, my question was answered. I was going to ask if 5A was going to be on the test. All right. Yeah, no. <laughs> Everything up to 12C that we're doing today. Um. I couldn't quite hear one thing that popped up a moment ago, but as far as the class meetings, um, I think just be checking your email because me and Sievers are going to go back and forth on who's instructing lessons, but each of us are going to have a different uh, Zoom meeting ID. We can't actually use the same one because they'd be our personal accounts sort of thing. So it's like giving somebody else your email access. That, uh, so you be checking your emails just to make sure you know who's going to be like running it uh, or just have both numbers and then jump into the rooms and you know, it's going to be one or the other that you have to Yeah, I was about to say we both have that office hours like right before this. So it's not too hard to find out which room. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and see if there's the, the number you're going to use for classes on Zoom, that's going to be consistent. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's my yeah. yeah. Yeah, so for everybody, there's two different numbers you need to know with Zoom. There's one for me, one for Seavers. It's a 50-50, you go to the wrong room, just, you know, nobody's in there, you're by yourself, jump to the other one and you'll probably find everybody. I have a question. Internet, but I, I um, took pictures of everything I was trying to do to get back on, and then I had to wait for a long time to be let back into the, the group. Is that like an account against me? Um, I was waiting for Seavers to answer. Uh, uh, meaning you got bumped out, and then we had to admit you back in. Is that what you mean? Said, uh, I had to wait. Back in, yeah. yeah. Okay. So no, that's that stuff's never going to count against you. I don't. I don't think either of us are like playing that game of like trying to catch people. Um, what I'm looking for here is if you are in attendance, like that you're involved in what we're doing. So at least that you're logged in the room. There's a few people I wish that I had, I had heard from today that could have chimed in on stuff, but. Uh, uh, yeah, we're we're not looking to get you on stuff. Just like, uh, and and I would almost look at it more as like a, oh man, I didn't notice that you were trying to get back in the class and feel bad on my end versus trying. To, yeah, um, I usually go by the policy that if there is an issue with something that you, if I don't mention anything to you, then it's not even on my radar. So. I, I have a question real quick. Um, so how how early are you guys already going to be on the chat, like for office hours, if we wanted to come on and get some extra help right before uh, class started? I'm on at four, and and he's he comes in at five. Okay, so yeah. on the on the same chat, you guys will already be on there, just in case anyone has. Yeah, I'll still. be on my chat. Cool. He'll be on his. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, that's correct. Um, um, I suppose that if, because, you know, my schedule is a little bit more open. Um, uh, maybe if somebody thinks they're going to need a little bit more work with, and, and you're looking for me, just send me an email and maybe I can open it up a little bit earlier. Sort of thing. Um, the unusual, so all this is like new stuff, right? And like with my high school classes, Today I had office hours for an hour broken up for different classes that I teach and I didn't have like one person show up. Um, so that's kind of the one thing is I don't want to necessarily have something open and sit here for about an hour and nobody actually comes in like for help. So, so if you want before five o'clock, I would say just to send me an email and I don't have any problem with it. Like I said, I got time. Will those be set up the way that we all join in together, or is it going to be wait until this person's done and then you're next in line? I didn't catch any of that, Severs. I think she's saying, like, I, I think what you're saying is, is, like, do you have to wait on other people to complete the test? No, you can just do the test whenever. It basically, basically, as soon as you open your test, you're going to have like a two and a half hour window to like complete it and be able to submit it is the main thing. But yeah, no, nobody else is going to restrict your access to it or should not. Right. Famous last word should not should not have any effect. Yeah. What time did you decide to open it? Is it Thursday and Friday, right? Is what we're doing all day, I believe. Yeah. Um, okay. so, so Thursday at, um, God, what would that be? Um, 12 a.m. <laughs> well, we got any early birds. <laughs> if you got, if you got insomnia and you want to start the test immediately, sure. Uh, but yeah, it'll be open up so you can get into it. Like, like Seaver said though, don't open that test and start it until like you're ready to go though. Because if you decide to open it up at 3 a.m., you got to be done by 5.30 a.m.
Um, I would honestly take Thursday to study. It'll be open, but just take Thursday to study and then you can either test Thursday night or like Friday at any point. So that's scanned, it has to be open and scanned back in and closed in that time period. Yes. Yeah. And if we have an issue? Um, as a backup, uh, as a backup, I would have you take a picture, like, like a picture that you can also timestamp. So if you don't trust the technology, which I don't always, like trust the technology that it's gonna get uploaded, if you can still timestamp like, a photograph that of your work okay then um, then at least that's a backup you don't need to send it to us but if something shows up then you can at least communicate and I, I believe it was still, I believe you can still submit it even if you are late so like even if you are like running late and you still need to submit it like it's better late than never you know yeah but we should be able to oh. see the time, and it will tell us whether you're late or not on there. It tells us like what time exactly you turn stuff in and everything. Oh, let me make one more statement about the test because I just talked about taking pictures of it. Okay, so that's a thought that's already gone through our head and everybody today to see that you guys can't be taking pictures and like sending them to each other so that you can copy the work. All right, the way that we avoid that even being an option, there's three different versions of the test. But in the three different versions, they're going to be very, very like subtle details. Like a uh, population might be 650 in one problem, but on somebody else's test, it might be 630. Okay, so they're going to be very, very subtle things that still require you to do your own work um, to get the problems done. And it's enough that if that number shows up on your test when it's not supposed to, we're going to have trouble. So anyway, I lay that out there just so it's not even an idea. Um, don't take it personal, but you may have somebody else in class who like texts you later and says, man, I'm really freaking out. Can you help me out? The best answer is, well, it probably isn't going to work anyway. Just let's not do that. Okay. I saw, I saw, um, at Texas. had to uh, take the test again on a video conference. Is there a question there? Did I, did I hear that right? I didn't catch much. I got like two words out of what he had said. Yeah, I didn't hear what the question was. It wasn't a question. I was just saying at Texas State, if they they suspected you of cheating, you had to retake the exam on a live video conference with your professor. Oh, uh, heck no. We ain't doing that, man. If you already like cheated, you're not going to waste my time. Like, <laughs> uh, what, like, so, so I've been writing tests for a long time with like high school kids and they love to cheat. So, um, I, what I do is I make sure that there's certain things in the test that become like red flags immediately. Like, if you have a certain answer on your test that is unique to another one, then we already know that like it's an impossibility that you accidentally got their answer on your test. So, um, yeah, we like if there was like a cheating issue, you're just going to get a zero. That's how it is. But you're not going to cheat, right? Right, Richard? <laughs> I have a question for clarification. Uh, test in a, during the test. Are we going to to print the 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 test? Then we do, and then we upload it. Or what, are we going to do it on the computer? Um, you're going to do it on. Like here's my preference. Um, Steve can chime in a second if you want something different. But my preference is that you're doing it on paper. You have two options on how you do it on paper, though. You can either print the copy of the test right on that, uh, take the picture, scan it back to us, or you can just do the answers on a separate piece of paper. Just make sure that they're nice, that they're nicely numbered, and you can then send that back to us. 
Yeah, and that might be a good idea to like have your printer set up before you start opening up the test. Make sure your printer's open and working. Make sure your ink's not clotting up. Because on this one, it might actually be kind of beneficial to print out the test because there's going to be tables on there. It might save you a little time. Oh, okay. I'd hate so when you print, yeah. <laughs> so when you print, when you when you start printing your your test, now the timing the time will start timing you. As soon yeah. as you open it, yeah. Yeah, but oh. our, our idea of the test, um, mm -hmm. we'll double check, we'll think about it a little bit more, but we confidently believe that the test, people are gonna be finishing it as early as about 45 minutes in. But it's not gonna take all of that time. There's gonna be other people who are gonna take longer, which is fine, but we don't believe that anybody should need more than two hours. Oh, okay. So by setting it for two and a half, that extra half an hour, 30 minutes is intended just for printing and scanning and all of that. So um, we don't believe the test should be taking you two hours and 25 minutes to do it. And then there's this like panic sort of that's, process. Okay. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a question too then to add to that. Yes. So you're saying that if we, uh, if we print the test, do we leave the page open on our laptops or whatever saying like recording the time it took us to do it and then upload it or can we close the tab and then upload it and then you just see whatever time we sent it in i would probably keep the page open just so you can like re-upload it real quick and it doesn't like you don't waste time trying to get back to that website but like as soon as you open that thing it's going to start the timer right yeah okay you don't have to, I don't think you have to keep it open if that's the question, but like personally, yeah, yeah. but personally, I probably would just because it would save me time. Okay. And so then when we like, if we print it and we scan it back into you, we just, uh, there's like going to be somewhere like how we did the mock test. We just do the same thing. Yep. That's okay. why we had you do the mock test. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have a quick question about the order. Does it really matter which um, handout we start with for 5A? Um, in the description, I put the order that flows better. Um, I'll go ahead and read it to you, though. Let me just give me a second to find them. Um, I had them here a second ago. All right, so. Uh, the order that makes the most sense to do them in, it's going to start with the one that's called fundamentals. It's fundamentals of statistics, such and such. The second is going to be methods for sampling. Okay. Uh, and then the last is going to be the one that says types of studies and confidence intervals. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's the order that makes the most make sense on it. Um, I wrote, for everybody else, I did write that in the description box on Blackboard. I didn't check to see what it looked like after I did that, but um, you can also, you like, just so you don't have to bother email me again later if somebody forgets or it's not there, um, you can start the video and just to see where it begins, sort of thing. Oh, okay, yeah, I see where it says yeah. Did you figure out how to do test corrections or how they're going to do test corrections? Um, <laughs> no, it hasn't crossed my mind yet. I'm doing one thing at a time, but yeah, because <laughs> uh, I'm like I'm still learning how to grade the stuff through the system, and um, it's a little weird. Like, um, 
I, I think I have a little bit of an idea, but oh, so for everybody that's there, look, man, I know I mentioned this at the beginning of the semester, but with the way that the grading is, because I got to open up files on the computer, I don't get to hold your paper. I really want you to imagine that uh, the test is going to be like seven pages and I have to open those up on a computer to look at them. So I am pleading with you, please put correct answers on your test and make sure you box them so that they're easy to see. Because if I can just go check, 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 and give you an A, I'd love it, okay? Yeah. What do you mean by box them? Like put or, them Oh, you know, like make sure that I can find them. Okay. You know, like you can box, you can circle. Um, if there's a little blank to put the answer in, put the answers in the blanks and, okay. you know, just uh, like how you guys did for 12C. I think everybody submitted that one. Not C, A. For 12, A, it was really easy to grade those, those two pages from everybody. But with the test, the thing is, is I'm going to want to be able to give you more feedback. But I don't know how I'm really going to do that. Like, it's, it's, it's a weird system. So um, correct answers do me a lot of good. One, um, it minimizes how much feedback I have to give. And two, it allows me to grade it really fast. So... Um, you know, you want to make your professor happy, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's why. When I'm happy, you get good grades. When you get good grades, you give me good evals. You know, that's how it works. Um, But not too good, not too good evals, because then, then the bosses think something suspicious is going on. So, you know. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Anything else? When is the homework due for this uh, one? Tonight. Yeah. By midnight, yeah. Um, it is literally, isn't it, isn't it just the one page? That's all it is, right? That, that table? Yeah, it should be. Yeah, so that shouldn't take you too long. And um, um, a lot of the kind of intermediate steps are taken out. So you're going to see that they got it like all of the, the four different methods. They're all on the same like paper right there for you. So I that actually do... I actually do have a question regarding the homework for tonight um, that I don't think we covered, or if we did, I missed it. Um, uh, the final one talks about the quota criterion. We talked about that one. Yeah, I missed that uh, one. Could we, uh, could we go back to that one really quickly? Uh, yep. Okay, so look. Quota criterion says that it's going to be like between the minimum quota and one plus that number. Say that again, Severs. Huh? What was that you just said? It's okay. So the quota criterion says basically that it's either, so if we have a min quota, like here at six, it's going to be either six or seven, right? That min quota, or it's going to be like one plus that min quota, right? And if you go beyond that, then you've broken your quota criterion. If you're adding more than one to your number, then you're you're going to break that quota criterion. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Kind of a little silly rule, but they ask about it, so. How long do I have to wait to watch this uh, session again? It should be posted up. I'll go ahead and I'll post the link from, from my like YouTube to the uh, Blackboard.
like Mr. Martinez has his math page. I'll have I'll have my math page going to my YouTube. I have one more question too about um, today's assignment that we're turning in. Okay. Um, I was just confused on the part where um, for the Hill Huntington apportionment, which I was trying to like figure out when we were going over the work together today too. Mm -hmm. um, so the do, are you taking the um, the apportionment comes from the geometric mean or does it come from the modified quota? Because so the, I know there's a, bounding. So there's a rule that you have to like compare these two. And if this right. one is more than this one, then we add one. Right. So we're comparing the modified quotient to the geometric mean. Right. Okay, so um, so but which one are you? You're adding you're you're rounding up or you're adding one? We're we're adding one to our min q. Oh, okay. If this one is more than this one, and this one is less than this one, we just keep it the same. This one is more than this one, so we add one to that min q. Right. No, but like how you're talking about you add one. We're we're obviously like we're not adding a full one, a whole number. We're just rounding up to the nearest one. Yeah, you, yeah. You you can think of it as adding one to maybe the min q, but yeah, you're rounding this number up is basically what what it is. Right. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, yep. I was confused with the modified quota instead of the <laughs> mean. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I don't really like making people memorize things through like rote memorization. I like, I don't know, that's that's not math to me. I'm not really trying to be very hard on this rule. And so I'm, I'm pretty sure the test is in the same order as this. We're going to do the modified quotient before we do the geometric mean. So if this number goes down, you should add one. If it goes up, it stays the same. <clears throat> Any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. I think I'm going to turn. Nope. Okay. Turn the recording off then. See you on Wednesday. All right. See you on Wednesday.